Good evening, everybody. It's uh, 6 o'clock, and it's uh, Friday, so it's time for Flashcard Friday. And uh, today we're going to take our final look. I uh, thought I was going to get an extra one out of this, but I'm not going to. Uh, we're going to take our final look at the 10 lies that uh, Christians uh, tend to believe about themselves. And then we're going to actually look at what the Bible tells us um, is actually the truth in regards to all of that. And again, I, you know, I, I want to reiterate, these lies tend to fall in one of two categories, and it's Satan's greatest weapons. Uh, and that is when he makes us question who we are, or when he makes us question the nature of God. And, you know, so he, basically he's going to make us doubt ourselves, or he's going to make us think that God's holding out on us, that God's punishing us, or something to that effect. Um, and again, not a rule book. Uh, this is a love story. This is our... This is our relationship with God, and He's not a punitive God. Hey, Carol, um, so you just you make me smile every time. So uh, we're get, we're actually we're just gonna dive right in. Um, and the first one, the the first of of the final four lies is I need to perform to be seen. Uh, you know, and this is not you know this is not you know about going to church or going to work or, you know, anything like that and, and, and you know, and, and being seen. It's about doing things intentionally to be seen. Uh, you know, we, we seem to think that, you know, that the mouse that, that sits in the corner that, that never gets noticed isn't loved by God. Um, and, that's, and that's not true. And, you know, so even we're going to talk about Ruth and Naomi in this. And it appears on the outside that, that Ruth is doing things to be noticed. Um, but there are a couple of scriptures in her story that, that actually show that she's not. You know, she's, she's kind of in the middle of a crowd. She's just trying to do things, to, you know, to keep herself and Naomi alive. Uh, but to kind of start this story, Naomi, um, Naomi is an, is an Israelite. And uh, her husband dies, and then, w you know, within just a really short time, her two sons die. And her sons were married to two, uh, to two Moabite women, uh, one named Ruth and the other named Orpah. So Naomi realizes she's too old uh, to have any more children, which means these ladies... Um, can never in, in that society they could never be seen as as anything more than leftovers so to speak um so she tells that she tells both of them you know go back um go back to your moabite families uh, <clears throat> excuse me you know go you know go back to your family go back to go back to the gods that you used to worship before you started following god and uh, at first both of the women, both of the girls say no you know, we're, we're not going to leave you. You're our, you're our mother-in-law. Um, but then after she pleads with them one more time, Orpa decides to go back to her family. But Ruth, Ruth basic, basically says, I'm not going to leave you. Um, you are my mother-in-law. You are my family. Um, I'm, I'm tied to you. So they travel back to Bethlehem uh, in hopes that, you know, that somehow... You know, um, either Naomi's name can be restored, her family name can be restored, or that she just dies in her homeland. And Ruth, you know, is obviously younger and, and very beautiful. So she's out in the fields, and, and she's kind of, she's going behind the workers uh, to just to get grain and stuff to keep, uh, you know, to, to feed both her and Naomi when she's noticed, you know, and again, you know, this is somebody, she's not, you know, she's not out there, you know, dressed to the nines, you know, picking, you know, picking, picking wheat and waving at everybody. She's, she's doing this under the radar. She's trying to be quiet. She's asked for permission, you know, from the field workers to do this. Um, you know, so she's just, she's just kind of there, but she gets noticed by Boaz who actually owns these fields, you know, so, um, <clears throat> Boaz tells, uh, you know, the, the different people working in the fields to ensure that they leave and drop some extra uh, so that so the roof can be taken care of. 
And then eventually he has a conversation with Ruth, you know, where he says, you know, look, you know, I, I understand you're in a difficult situation and I just want to make sure that you're taken care of. You're part of my family um, because Naomi, Naomi is a distant relative to Boaz. Um, so when we look at uh, Ruth chapter 2, um, verses 22 and 23, um, again, Ruth has been told by Boaz uh, that, that, she can pick, uh, that she can pick behind these workers and that none of the men working in the field are going to touch her. You know, they, they have been told specifically she's off limits. And, you know, and again, that, you know, that's a big deal because in that day and age, um, she could be, you know, she could be taken and, and forced, uh, you know, to, forced to become somebody's wife or, you know, uh, she could be raped. You know, all these kinds of things could happen to her. But Boaz, you know, Boaz made it clear that that wasn't going to happen. So after all of this, Ruth goes to tell Naomi what's happened. And uh, so Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, my daughter, it is good for you to work with the female servants so that nothing will happen to you in another field. Ruth stayed close to Boaz's female servants and gathered grain and barley and wheat, and, wheat har and, and the wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, you know, again, the whole point of this is she's in the middle of a bunch of other people working. She's not doing anything to be noticed. But what's really cool um, is in chapter 4, Ruth and Boaz marry. And Ruth gives birth to a son. And that son's name is Jesse. And if the name Jesse sounds familiar to you, it's because Jesse is King David's father. So she is actually in the line of Jesus. And she didn't need to perform to be seen. In all of this, God saw her and he took care of her. So think about the things that you do. Um, the things that you do at work. The things that you do when you're out and about. Are you doing them intentionally trying to be noticed? Or do people notice you just because? Some of you may think... That, that doing things to be noticed is bad or, or that, you know, we as Christians, we're supposed to duck our heads and, and work, you know, and just, just do the work. But here's the thing. God sees you. Um, God sees you in your brightest days and he sees you in your darkest days. Um, we're actually about to, to look at some of the darker, uh, the darker days that, that God never leaves us. Um, but the big thing here is you don't need to perform to be seen by God. He sees you no matter what circumstances you're in. The next one we're going to look at is I am alone. And, uh, you know, I think of all of the people in the Bible, Job uh, would have the most to say, you know, about being alone. He lost, uh, he lost everyone except for his wife. He lost all of his children. Uh, you know, and, and to, to no doing of his own. Uh, you know, th this was, you know, this was one of those things where, where Satan attempted to prove something to God, but, you know, but God wanted to make it clear that, uh, that Job would be faithful above all else. So there's a point, uh, you know, when, when Job is in a spot where he feels alone, you know, it's, you know, it's again, he, he's lost, he's lost his fortune. He's lost all of his, um, he's lost all of his crops, all of his herds, um, all of his servants have walked away, and he's lost all of his children. Uh, you know, and his wife, even at one point, says, why don't you just curse God and die? Uh, you know, and don't hold that against her. You know, you have to keep in mind, too, that she lost all of her sons and daughters as well. You know, so this is a woman speaking out of grief. But in Job 2, verses 11 and 12, we see something happen. Now when Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the, the Naamathite, sorry about that, uh, heard about all his adver adversity, 
that happened to him, each of them came from his home. They met together to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they looked from the distance, they could barely recognize him. They wept out loud. Each man tore his robes and threw dust in the air on his head. Uh, that's, a, that's an Israelite custom of, of showing being in mourning. Now, Job's three friends are going to go on and they're going to they're going to eventually say some bad things, uh, you know, and they're going to get in a little bit of trouble from from God because they question um, they question whether or not Job committed a sin, you know, because again, in that day and age, it was widely believed if calamity like this fell upon you, that um, that you were guilty of some sort of unrepentant sin. So even though his friends are going to do you know, all of these things, what we really need to see in this, that his friends never leave. For 42 chapters, yeah, right about there, 42 chapters, his friends are there. He's never alone. You know, and even at a point, you know, where, where he thinks all is lost, you know, God comes down and says, um, None of us left you, you know. You, you've, uh, you're, you're not alone. Uh, it's actually, it's, it's kind of funny. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Uh, at the very end, you know, jo you know, Job's kind of final lament, you know, of I've had enough. You know, I can't take this anymore. He start, he starts calling God out. Sorry again. This is a new, this is a new Bible. So some of my pages are still sticking. Um, you know, he, he basically, he calls out to God and he's like, you know, even you have left me. And, uh, let me see, let me see if I can find this really quick. Cause it's just really. Oh yeah, yeah. This is this is God. This is God starting to talk to Job, and it's in uh, chapter forty-one. Uh, can you pull a leviathan with a hook, or tie his tongue down with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose, or pierce his jaw with a hook? No one is ferocious enough to rouse a leviathan. Who can stand? Who can stand against me? Uh, you know, and basically, I, I, God just, he, he goes on here, you know, this whole time to say, you know, look, I knew this was going to happen to you. Uh, I've never left you. I've always been with you. Uh, you need to accept that. And then, you know, and then Job's, Job's final response, and I wish I had my other one because it, because it's so much better. Um, in 42 verse 5, uh, Job says, I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. You know, so in, in the middle of, of Job's turmoil and probably at his lowest point, he looks and he finally sees God. God met him in the deepest part of his pain and walked him through it and eventually restores everything that Job had. You're never alone. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You know, maybe in the middle of the pandemic, you lost your job or got laid off. God was right there with you. Maybe you lost a family member um, or somebody really close to you, you know, whether it's due to illness or due to them walking away. God, God never walked away from you. He's still right there. Um, you know, he's going to carry you through any storm that you go through, you just have to let him. And that leads me to this. <laughs> I, I can't tell you the, these last two. I, I think I've said them more than any of the others. And I know I said I, I know I said that before, um, but these two like really personify me a lot. Um, if only I was like this person or that person, or if only I could speak. You know, if only I could speak like Beth Moore, or if only I was educated, 
you know, like Tim Keller, you know, you know, all of, all of the, all of these different things that, you know, that we try and, we try and compare ourselves, you know, to somebody else or, you know, to say that God can't use me because I'm just not good enough. Uh, and that is one of the biggest lies that, uh, that we have a tendency to believe in. I was going to pick somebody else, but there, I'm sorry, there is just nobody better than Moses. Um, Moses has been called to lead the Israelites out of exile from Egypt. Um, he's going to have to go up against, um, he's going to have to go up against the Pharaoh, you know, and it's widely believed that Moses stuttered, you know, so he's not really looking forward to having to talk to somebody who has been professionally professionally trained. So in verse 4, um, or in chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Moses basically, you know, basically just cries out to God and he says, please, Lord, send someone else. Send anyone else. And then in verse 14, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, um, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and also he is on his way now to meet you, and he will rejoice when he sees you. So basically, God already knew that that, that Moses was, was going to pull this, and he already had somebody on his way to help him. But here's the thing. Mo, even, though, even though Moses used Aaron in that situation, Moses didn't need him. Uh, because if you turn to Exodus 14... And look at verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back on the Egyptians and on their chariots and on their horsemen. Now this is part two um, of Moses raising his hands. In the first one, he parts the Red Sea so that the Israelites could cross on dry land. Um, they didn't even get a toe wet. Uh, you know, Moses literally parted the sea with a wave of his hand at the Lord's command. And then when he gets on the other side, he doesn't have to beat anybody with words or anything like that. He raises his hands again, and the waters close on, on the Egyptians. And he saves all of the Israelites with just him and God. Aaron wasn't in that equation um, it didn't have to be Aaron. And from that point forward, uh, Aaron really doesn't do a whole lot of speaking. He gets in a little bit of trouble because he's the one that makes the calf or uh, makes, you know, makes the, the bronze cow that, that they worship. Uh, but Aaron doesn't do a whole lot. It's Moses who continually speaks after that and, and leads and leads the Israelites um, almost to the promised land. He doesn't get to he doesn't get to enter at that point. Um, but he, you know, but it was, it was him. It wasn't, it wasn't Aaron. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't his sister. Uh, it was Moses. Moses did it. And Moses did it because God chose him. So when you look at your own life and you start comparing yourself to the people at work, um, you know, the, the other situations, you know, going on, uh, where where comparison has become your your biggest tool and the biggest weapon used against you, just know this: God chose you. Like He looked over a sea of people, and He said, "That's my daughter. That's my son. They're mine, and that's all that matters." God chose you, and He's going to do extraordinary things with the ordinary things that you do in your life. You just have to trust him to do it. And the final one, um, and I, I apologize, I'm running just a little bit long here. Um, I'm gonna see if I can do this one without crying. Um, I am not accepted. That is the biggest lie. Uh, just, just bar none. And you, you could literally, you could pick any character uh, in this Bible, and at some point in time, 
they didn't feel accepted. But there's a woman in, uh, in Genesis, and her name is Leah. And uh, depending on your version of the Bible, um, you'll hear that she had tender eyes or lazy eyes or something, you know, something to that effect. And uh, most scholars believe she likely had a lazy eye and she wasn't very pretty. Uh, she was the oldest daughter of Laban. And uh, her younger sister, Rachel, uh, was the one that everybody was after. Everybody thought she was beautiful. And along comes um, Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Uh, Jacob is the son of Isaac. And, uh, you know, uh, Jacob has, he's run away from his brother Esau. And he comes across this woman and, you know, he comes across Rachel and he just falls head over heels for her. And he wants her to be his wife. But there's Leah. Leah's the oldest. Leah's supposed to be married first. But again, she's not very pretty. Um, she's likely got a lazy eye. Um, so Laban tricks Jacob into marrying Leah. Uh, you know, Jacob thinks that he's actually marrying Rachel, but she's got a veil over her face at the at the ceremony. So he doesn't realize that he's just married Leah and he's disappointed. You know, and then he, you know, he works an additional seven years in order to be able to marry Rachel. And, you know, a lot of times that's kind of how we gloss over Leah. Uh, I can't imagine what Leah felt. How would it feel to have your father trick somebody into marrying you? How would it feel to know that your father thinks that low of you, that he has to trick somebody? And then, I can't imagine what was going on in her heart when Jacob raises the veil, sees that it's her, and he's disappointed. The pain that she had to be going through, she had to be literally saying, I'm not accepted. But again, if we go back up to here, God sees. God sees us all, and God saw her. And this, this is going to, for all of the verses for me to pick, for me to pick this one, seems a little strange, but in Genesis 29, 35, um, and this is, they're talking about Leah here. Uh, and she conceived again, gave birth to a son, and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she named him Judah. And then Leah stopped having children. Now Leah had given birth to six sons and a daughter. Um, all, you know, all with Jacob. And, uh, these, you know, all of these sons are part of the 12 tribes, you know, the eventual 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, but there's an important thing about Judah. Because, you see, Rachel had two children. She had two boys um, with, with Jacob, and she had them well after Leah had her children. Um, Rachel gave birth to Joseph and Benjamin. You know, so again, you know that Joseph is the one that sold into slavery and all of that. Um, but Leah gave birth to Judah. And uh, if you look in the genealogy of Jesus, Rachel's name isn't mentioned. But Leah's is. Because Leah gave birth to Judah. And uh, Judah is the, I don't even know how many greats, uh, grandfather to Jesus. So, she may not have been accepted in the beginning, except that, you know, again, even at that, you have to stop and think. He kept going back to her. There was, you know, Jacob kept going back. So there had to be something about her personality, um, or something about her her mannerisms that he kept going back. Um, but no matter what, God accepted her. Um, God accepted God accepted her multiple times, and God took care of her. And in the end, um, not many people remember Rachel, but her name will forever be known 
in the genealogy of Jesus. So I don't know who that person is who's made you feel just a little bit less than. Maybe, you know, maybe you've had somebody tell you you're just not quite good enough. You know, if you'll just do this, then we'll accept you in. That's all a bunch of lies. Um, what matters is that God loves you more than anything. Not a rule book. Not a, not a collection of morality tales. This is a love story between you and the one who loves you and wants to take care of you more than anyone, our Savior. Believe that. Let go of these lies and believe in the one who's never left you uh, and who sees you always. I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me. I hope that you have a phenomenal weekend, and I look forward to seeing each and every one of you on Sunday. Talk to you later. Bye.